Thank you, Mary Lou. You're very kind. You've been most helpful, believe me. But anyway, I hope that I can inform you a bit about Ethel Dawson. Um, members of the Historical Society, guests and everybody. Um, some of the people, some of the things I have found out recently have been in the last two weeks. One of her great nieces sought on the internet and contacted the Historical Society. They contacted me. I've been in contact with her two or three times. And last week when she sent me an email, she said, well, my husband's out golfing. She lives in Chilliwack, BC. <laughs> and she found out about this by going on to Google. And she said she had seen about this great ad a few years ago, but she figured there was more to learn about her. So she went on recently, and I'm, she said, fortunately, it just turned out that this was on the Historical Society's um, website. So anyway, I, I've written this up four times, and I hope that um, we can get through this. Mary Lou is going to, we're going to try this. I've never done this before with this, but anyway. <clears throat> Ethel May Dawson was an RN, and it's my pleasure to speak to you tonight about her. She was born, and I've got to read some of this because I, she was born in Specks Hall, Suffolk, England, <coughs> on May the 2nd, 1875. She lived in Frogs Hall Lane in Swanton Morley, Norfolk, England. <laughs> and her father uh, farmed uh, 36 acres with the oldest son, who was a little bit older than Ethel, although he was only a young child. Anyway, if you, if you uh, if you can't hear me or if something needs to be changed, just let me know. It could be louder, please. You could? Uh -huh. You mean I have to yell louder? Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. I, I, thought I, was, I thought I always speak loud because I worked in a retirement home for 10 years before we come back to Collingwood. And I thought that I, even my husband or the kids would say, you don't have to talk like that to us, Mom. But anyway. You let me know if I don't speak loud enough because I got two hearing aids too, so I understand the problems. Anyway, in uh, 1884, she sailed from Liverpool to Quebec City <coughs> on the SS Polynesian and with her parents, Fred and Mary, and an old, older siblings, Nellie and William, who they called Fred, and younger siblings, Ernest, Kathleen, and Albert. She landed in Quebec on October the 5th, 1884, and they settled in Brantford, Ontario. And after, okay, shortly after getting settled, Nellie, the 13-year-old, and William, who was Fred, age 12 years old, died of typhoid fever down in Brantford, and that is their dates of their demise. Um, and in 1894, Mr. B.B. B. Osler built a beautiful stone house on the mountain for his beautiful wife, who had severe arthritis and he wanted her to be able to have some fresh air outdoors. So he, he um, looked for a manager and gardener and brought Mr. Fred Dawson and family to Collingwood. But unfortunately, in 1895, May the 3rd, 
Mrs. Osler died after enjoying only one visit to what we call the Castle on the Mount. And she had named it Chiamonto, Chiamontio, sorry, which means the top of the mountain in India. And she really liked it, but unfortunately her health did not allow her to spend time there. But we believe that the, um, yeah, those are pictures of the, up in the castle as it went downhill. Now it's just uh, nothing. I remember being up there when I was in Harry Bell's class in grade seven. Harry, <coughs> Harry hired a school bus and took us up to the castle on the mountain. And I remember going through it. All of the plumbing had been pulled out. The taps were all gone. Everything was just a mess. And since then, it has got worse. That, um, that's a later one. But anyway, then we believe they lived at 122 6th Street in a house across from Victoria School. And I'm sure a lot of you people that are here would remember Toots and Britt Burns living in that house for many years. Toots' family, Whitney's, owned it before them. But Toots and Britt lived in that many years. And they, Ethel and, since Ethel and her brother, okay, we can go to the next one. That's the g &M Hospital in 1900. And she, when they were setting up a training school in 1898, she decided that that would be her calling because her brother and her sister had died of typhoid. So she decided to enter the g &M School of Nursing. And she entered the School of Nursing in 1898 and was in the first graduating class in 1900. And she is seated sec first when, second from the left. And she, we don't know if she took the Florence Nightingale Pledge at that time, but she certainly lived it all her life. She took up a career of caring and comforting the ill. She became an RN, registered nurse, in 1903. The GNM Nurses Alumna, well that's her name, and this is her picture. Her shows in the book, there's a book over there you can look at that has the 1900 class. And that's the Florence Nightingale Pledge. Anybody that went into nursing uh, in later years had to, at graduation, you had to get up and read that or say it, speak it. That, um, I have a copy here I'll put over there and you can read it, anybody that's interested. In 1905, <coughs> excuse me, she became a member of the fully newly formed nurses, g &M Hospital Nurses Alumna. And it's still going strong. In 1906, we think that this picture, and when, you, when Mary Lou puts the next one, some of you ladies, I'm sure, are going to recognize three people in that picture. Now maybe some of you will rec recognize more of them. But Helen Campbell and I looked at it, and we know three of them that are in that picture. The second from the right up there was Audrey Shields, Jeffrey, Curry. The one up, one, two, three, the fourth one is 
uh, Winnie Cooper. Winnie Cooper Prentice. And this one hiding down in behind here was Mae Bryden. So some of you would recognize. Now if anybody recognizes any of the rest of them, I'd like to know because we did recognize those three. And she was on a sick visiting committee for many years in the alumna. They used to go out and visit all the sick people <coughs> they knew. And that continued. And she was secretary in 1908. And she has, it must have been that ill, she must have been ill that year. Because she, in the, I have the minute books of the Nurses Alumna from 1905, the original book, right up until now. Yeah, I'm only missing one, 1918 to, in that era. Anyway, she must have been ill that year and she gave the alumna a thank you note for their kindness to her during her illness. And she became president September 5th, 1912 and continued until 1916. Her name also appears in the minute books of the 30s and 40s. So she always, appear, I think, went to the alumna. And in 1913, she became, we'll go to the next one there, will you? She became the first public health nurse, truant officer, and school nurse for Collingwood, continuing in that capacity until 1948, when the Simcoe County Health Unit took over. She visited patients in their homes in hospital, and Helen Campbell, trained in the 1930s, graduated in 39, said she used to come to the hospital around four o'clock every day, and she visited the men's and women's ward. She didn't go to the private rooms. She went to the men's and women's wards to visit the patients that were there. And it's, just, it's said she delivered between 2,000 and 2,200 babies. Many families did not have many um, medical care and also had large families, and they couldn't afford it. And this birth control was, had not been heard of in those days. Many could not afford a doctor, so she was their lifeline. We have one of Ethel's babies with us tonight. She delivered Jeannie McEachern Mackison at home. And that is Jeannie with her grandmother. She also delivered babies in the hospital she had a clinic and well baby clinics at the town hall originally, and then she transferred it <coughs> then to All Saints Anglican Church, where she carried on for many years. And many families could not afford to bury their babies who died, and she bought two plots out in all Saints Cemetery, where she paid to have them buried because the families could not afford it. And during the flu epidemic, she had a clinic set up at All Saints Church where she nursed them day and night by herself, and the minister helped a bit. Um, as school nurse, <laughs> <clears throat> As school nurse, she visited Victoria School, Connaught School, King George School, and St. Mary's School. And many of us here tonight, I know, remember her, I'm sure. And she, and I can still see her parking her car on Maple Street. I think it was a dark blue Ford Coupe. Now I've been told it was dark blue, I thought it was, and somebody said, well they thought it was black, but 
it was a dark one. <laughs> and she had to park it so she could drive away because she couldn't back up. <laughs> and I've been told that by many people. Anyway, she would get out. I can still see her getting out of the car, grabbing her little black bag, like little doctors. Probably always you had one at some point in time, just a little one like that. And little, sh and little short steps she took because she was short. And she used to come with these little short steps, come bustling into this girl's entrance to Victoria School. She'd go, went into the principal's office, Huey Davidson's, to get ready for all of us to be called in. She weighed us, she measured our height, she looked in our mouths and checked our teeth, she checked our tongue, our throat with tongue depressors as I, I don't remember the tongue depressors but a lot of people do, and checked our hair for lice. And she told one lady, she said, your hair's long, you don't have lice, but you should get a cut because you might get some. <laughs> <laughs> These are things people have told me in the last month. <laughs> anyway, and she, she'd turn her hands, she'd look at them, we had to turn them over, and she'd check her fingernails and check between her fingers. <sighs> anyway, after I got into, I never could figure out why. After I got into nursing, I got thinking, maybe it was for scabies, possibly. I don't know. But anyway, so she gave immunization shots to many students that didn't go to doctors, couldn't, their parents couldn't afford to, or some of them just didn't get there, and they, she would give it to them. And I've been told by a couple people she gave a mean needle. <laughs> Fortunately, I never had one, so I can't comment on that. I, she never gave me one. And after class, examinations were finished, and she was all finished with everybody, and they were back in their class. Sometimes she'd come to the door and say to the teacher, I need that student and so and so and so and so. She'd take them with her. And if it was in the winter, when they came back, they might have a new winter jacket, boots, hats, mitts, whatever she, they needed for winter. In the summer, or in the warmer weather, one lady said, she said, you've got new shoes, what did you do with your old ones? And she said, I don't know. She said, well, if you can find them, you bring them in to me. So she would, if they weren't too bad, she would take them and give them to the, some of the poor students that really didn't have much anything. But she was truly a friend of the poor and needy. And at one time, the VON board bought her a new car, which President Gordon Hewitt, who I'm sure several of you will remember, he was an optometrist in town, took her out to help her learn to drive it. He never did get her to back up. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it, well, surely I talked to her about it, his wife, and she said, yeah, he said he could never get her to back it up. <laughs> but anyway, and then in, in the fall, she would take her car to Sid Lewis's garage to have it winterized, and chains put on the tires the, so she could go out in all kinds of weather. It didn't stop her. She'd get the chains on, and out she'd go. And she received in the beginning a small salary and had her own car she dealt with, used it. And in later years, 
they did eventually give her a bit of a car allowance, the town. Anyway, she will be remembered for her BON uh, work, school nurse, public health nurse, children's aid work. She was on the board of directors of the GNM Hospital and member of many organizations, the IODE, the Anglican Church Auxiliary, the True Blue Lodge, and the Red Cross Society, from which she received um, an award in later years. And she was a member of All Saints Anglican Church and a member of the choir. And on Sunday, June 1949, windows were dedicated to her at All Saints for 50 years of service to Collingwood. Women's groups, home and school associations, municipal bodies, and friends provided the funding for the windows. And at the end of the service, the offering that was taken up was given to Ethel Dawson to do what she wished with it. She didn't, it was just given to her. She could do whatever she wanted with it. And in 2002, the small crosses were on the two plots out of the cemetery, and they had been disappearing. Um, so in 2002, a stone was placed there for Ethel's babies circa 1900 to 1953. And Ethel Mae Dawson is a private duty nurse, home nurse, hospital nurse, delivered babies as a midwife, visited hospital patients daily, as well as the home patients, was trained through an officer and school nurse. And I was told by a teacher that when they had a problem, they never contacted the parents directly. They contacted Ethel Dawson, she came in, and she dealt with the problem. And the teacher's here tonight that told me that. <laughs> Marie Crookshank. That's right. Mm -hmm. that. She dealt with it very well, too. And that's what you said. <laughs> that way, it was dealt with the truant officer and the school nurse were the ones, was the one that dealt with these problems, so the teachers weren't involved. <clears throat> Ethel had some illness in 1953 and passed away at her home on Pine Street on October the 3rd, 1953. And that's her brother and sister who survived her, Albert and Kathleen. And the great niece from out in Chilliwack was Kathleen's granddaughter. And one of her older brother um, also lived in Collingwood. And his, his granddaughter lives in Collingwood also. Um, all Ernest's granddaughter, all of um, Shopcott, is a great niece of Ethel Dawson's. Her grandfather was a sister brother of Ethel's. But anyway, she was buried from her beloved church, All Saints Anglican, <clears throat> and her pallbearers were Dr. Donald McKay, <clears throat> Mr. Ed Smart, Mr. Claire Trott, Mr. Hugh, Hugh Davidson, Mr. Cecil Kilpatrick, and Dalton Saunders. And the honorary pallbearers were Frank Cortis, Alan McIntosh, and John Smart. And she was, well, we had her brother and her sister Kathleen there. Um, and she's buried beside her parents 
Fred Dawson <coughs> and Mary Ann Bloomfield out in All Saints Cemetery. And I'm sure she read the nurse's prayer many times during her lifetime. I have a copy and I'll put it over there. And she also, I'm sure, she lived the Florence Nightingale pledge that, you know, and she was truly a loving, caring, spiritual lady who never married but gave of herself to help humanity. And I'm sure a lot of you people probably remember her. And I'm sure I'm looking for some stories <laughs> that some of you people have on Ethel Dawson. Right oh, now. Somebody's got to have stories. <laughs> <laughs> um, my mother was Bessie Saunders, Bessie oh. Ridgeway Saunders. Yes, and, yes. And um, Miss Dawson was uh, her inspiration to become a nurse. She graduated from GNM in 1942, but as a child, um, Nurse Dawson, she, my mother was one of the ones that got called out to get the winter coat. And she always found that kind of embarrassing, and they'd never do that today, but um, she always was appreciative of the, of the winter coat, of course. But the other thing that um, my mom told me was that uh, my, she had an older brother, Mervyn, or younger brother, Mervyn, and my mom always went with Mervyn and they took their, their wagon and they went to Nurse Dawson's house there on Pine Street and they would she would save them all her magazines. And so they, they got all the magazines because they wouldn't have any other way of getting. I don't know if you're aware of a little write-up your mother made, um, but if you sure. would like to read it, I have it over in my bag. Well, and I'd like to read it later. I will, and then, um, I have a picture also of the when the Red Cross gave the uh, Red Cross Society gave Nurse Dawson a that award. Yeah. I have a picture, and my grandfather was Dalton Saunders, the one of the pallbearers. Right. So right. he was his connection was with through the Red Cross, and um, I have that picture if you want that for your collection too. Uh, yeah. Um, well, if you ever want to get rid of any of it, I won't get rid of it, but I certainly give you a copy. <laughs> <laughs> I've got. Well, I think Joan can vouch for the fact that I've got a lot of stuff. <laughs> but anyway, <coughs> I'm sure somebody else must have some stories. I you wonder how many some, people. I wonder how many people here had Miss Dawson when they were in school. Stand up. Oh, quite a few, because you always knew when she was in the school, and you were really nervous. <laughs> Especially when she went through your hair. Because you always felt, oh, she may find something. I know she would weigh you, and she would remember who you were, and would tell you whether you had lost half a pound or a pound. You've done too much skipping, don't do as much this time. <laughs> She was extremely well respected by the kids and the teachers. <coughs> you must have some stories, Joan. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I probably got a few. <laughs> my biggest memory of her was I was an East Ender, so I had dirt under my nails. And she came out with that blessed fingernail <laughs> and cleaned it out. And I had it always ended up with hangnails on my thumbs. Well, they came out at the end of the tweet. Zip! <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Jean's right. Uh, she, she went through your hair the way she did everything. Oh, I know. I remember Whoa. her going through your hair. <laughs> but the one thing that stuck in my mind was why she, you know, so you had dirty fingernails. So you bit your fingernails. But. In later years, when I went into nursing, I'm thinking, maybe it was scabies she was looking for. <laughs> I don't know. Forget <laughs> it. But yeah. I see a lot of you people that went to school when she was here. Mm -hmm. yeah. My husband went to school at the King George School. 
what do you remember of her? She scared me. That's why I stopped speaking. <laughs> but I think she always loved the children hear feeling that they were loved and respected because of the care she did give, even though she may have frightened you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you probably weren't very uh, cooperative with her either, maybe. Could <laughs> be. But, uh, there was no red car before. You remember her. <laughs> you remember her, Helen? Yes, yes. I was at King George School, Dawn, and uh, uh, I talked to uh, Emily Wild Crew about this, and uh, and she said how you get so nervous being called, because she would come in and take over uh, Mr. Sproul's office and that was the nurse's office and of course uh, when she wasn't there and the phone would ring he'd send one of us up to answer the phone for him but when nurse Dawson was there then she did all of that and she'd come down the stairs and come in and point out who she needed to see and one of Emily's comments was I remember her writing our weight on a piece of paper was a, that was about the size of a sugar cube. <laughs> and I don't think she ever lost a piece either. She had those, uh, as Jeannie was saying, and she could tell you the next time you went in whether you had gained or lost weight. But I do believe that she looked under our nails for dirt. Yeah, and particularly in the spring, yeah. when we'd go out and uh, work on Smart's farm, or when the black walnuts were falling, and I still remember Billy Spooner going up with his hands black from the, the stain from those walnuts, and he gets sent home, and you couldn't possibly get the stain off those hands. It was just stain, but uh, but it was it was quite fun. And um, uh, but I think part of the the fear was, and like you, uh, Catherine, I never had a needle from her because my mother had this this strange theory that if every other kid in town was inoculated then they, they weren't going to get the disease, so I didn't need to be inoculated. Because I, there wasn't going to be any disease anyway. So I thought that was pretty smart thinking on her part. So I never had a, a needle. But those needles were like horse needles. They weren't those nice, fine needles that we can inject ourselves with now. They were those suckers that had an end on them that looked about an inch wide. So yes, there was fear as you got called up to Miss Dawson's office. Well, it was Emily Wilder. Emily yeah. Crew, yeah. who told me, oh, she said, she gave a mean needle. Yeah, that's, that's right. what I remember. Yeah. <coughs> and I said, I never had one, so I, yeah. 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 I had a few needles that I didn't think were great, but she wasn't one of the ones I could play. <laughs> well, that, um, anybody else? Um, no? Anyway. Thank you very much for On behalf of the society and everyone here, I'd just like to thank you, Catherine, for all the work and research that you put into that. I know how much work that is. And your personal stories and everyone else's stories really brought um, her inspiring and dedicated character to life. I've heard so much about her, and uh, only in small snippets, so this was really special for me and I know for everyone else here. So thank you so much on behalf of everyone here. I could have probably told you more, but I didn't <laughs> want to spend the night. <laughs> here. I don't know if some of you might be interested. The nurses have seen them before, but you might be interested. And I'll get Bessie Saunders' note out All right. thank for you. you. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.